The following episode is dedicated to the memories of Joe Schumacher, Wilford Brimley, John Saxon, and Danny Hicks. Hi, this is Maria Olson. You may know me from Trophy Heads or Starry Eyes and maybe Paranormal Activity 3. And I want to welcome you to Anthony T's Horror Show because it's an awesome show. Hi, my name is Jessica Cameron and you're listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Hey, fellow horror fans. This is Troy Escamella, the director of Party Night and Mrs. Claus. And you are listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Enjoy. Welcome to another edition of Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm Anthony T. In this edition, I will have not one, but two interviews. First, I'll be talking with director Dave Zagorski about his film Killing Brook, which recently was re-released by Wild Eye Releasing. After that, I will be talking to author slash director slash actress Lorraine Malloy. As we chat about her new film, Yield. But first, I want to start off with a topic. And it's about the way Universal Studios handled the announcement of delaying Halloween Kills. Now, just remember, this is just my views and my views only and not doc discussions. But when I heard of this release date change, I wasn't surprised. But I was surprised that they would wait to next October because I don't see why you would sit on a film for 14 months. But the thing that I don't agree with Universal Pictures about this release date change was the way they handled it. On July 8th, they released a teaser trailer of the film pretty much giving you 30 seconds of Halloween Kills. Then they follow up that this film isn't coming out until mid-October 2021. Now, Universal should have just done a press release like they have done with every other film that has been delayed due to current events. Because by teasing footage of a film that was supposed to come out this October, then at the end of teasing this footage, you're saying it's coming out mid-October 2021. That just does not sit well with some people because you're teasing a movie for next year. First of all, why are you releasing a teaser trailer 14 months before the film is supposed to come out? Because... I've never seen any film that has released a teaser trailer 14 months before its release date. Second, by doing that, it just makes the disappointment of the release date change more devastating. Because we are all looking forward to this film. Why would you tease footage of it then say, oh... It'll be out in 14 months. I just don't get it. I don't get Hollywood marketing. Because really, it just leaves a sour taste in your mouth. That you're excited to see this film. And they changed the release date right on the trailer release. There was no press release until right around when the trailer came out. But don't release a trailer and tell fans that a film that they've been waiting to see isn't coming out for another 14 months. Because quite frankly, I did not want to watch this trailer. It took me 
almost a month before I watched this trailer. In fact, I didn't watch this trailer just right until I started recording this segment because I was so angry at Universal Studios for doing that. Don't tease a film that's coming out this year, three, four months before its release, to tell them that, oh, by the way, it's coming out next year now. A simple press release would have just been sufficient. Instead, that was the worst way to handle a release date change, Universal Pictures. Not cool, Universal Pictures. Not cool. Every day, there's a family struggling with hospital bills to care for their sick child who is fighting an illness. There's a woman who is fighting breast cancer and is having trouble making ends meet while paying for their treatment. And there are burn victims that are going through treatments to heal their deep wounds. There is a charity in the horror community that helps these people. Scares That Care is an organization that helps families deal with the bills for their child. They help women get the treatment they need to fight breast cancer and they help people who are dealing with severe burns get the help they need to heal. Scares That Care is a 100% volunteer organization and 501c3 nonprofit charity that is dedicated to helping these people in fighting real monsters. To find out more information or to donate to Scares That Care, you can go to www.scaresthatcare.org. Every donation helps Scares That Care fight real monsters. Besides Anthony T's Horror Show, you can also listen to these other fine podcasts on the Doc Discussions Network. Doc Discussions, hosted by Phil Perone and Michael Darwin. You Know Nothing, Jon Snow, a Game of Thrones podcast. Bullets, Brothels, and Bots, a Westworld podcast. Halloween Boutique, Psychotronic Reviews. And Searching for American Gods. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com and Doc Discussions is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Welcome back to Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm here with director Dave Zagorski, whose film Killing Brook recently was re-released from Wild Eye Releasing. He is here today to talk about that film and his short film on the Mad Sea Productions YouTube page, Killer Sponge. How are you doing today, Dave? I'm all right, dude. How are you doing? Good. What made you get into the horror business of producing, writing, and directing? Oh, man. Um, I've been writing for since I can remember, and... Uh, out of high school, I was trying to write a novel, and uh, I didn't have the patience for it. So I'm like, I'm going to start writing movies. And I actually started off writing uh, action movies. Um, and then I wrote uh, a horror script called The Wicked's, um, which ended up being my first movie that was produced. Um, it's not very good, but it is on Amazon Prime to uh, check out. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I don't know, so I just, um, got into, uh, the horror genre basically because it's the easiest, um, genre to produce. Um, you don't need big stars, you don't need a huge budget, uh, you basically just need blood and gore and maybe a little TNA once in a while. Um, so, um, at the time I was working on a... Uh, web series. Uh, it was more of a teen teen romance kind of kind of deal. And uh, I talked to my crew. I'm like, hey, you guys want to make a movie? And they're like, yeah, let's do it. So I wrote Killing Brook, and we shot it in about 12 days, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> 
your film was first released in 2015. What was it like getting this film distributed by Wild Eye Releasing? Um, it was pretty cool. Um, seeing it, you know, available on um, websites, you know, Best Buy and Walmart, um, places like that. It, it was pretty cool. It was, it was definitely a further reach than I would have been able to do on my own. Um, you know, because I'm only able to uh, through conventions and and my website and everything. Um, so being distributed through Wild Eye was, was pretty nice. Um, it got a farther reach than than I uh, could have hoped. Now tell everyone about this film. Uh, so Killing Brook is sort of a uh, love letter to. You know, the 70s genre, uh, Last House on the Left, Texas Chainsaw Massacre style uh, horror movie. Um, Brooke is um, a newlywed. Um, her and her uh, wife, they uh, are on their honeymoon in a bar, um, and they pick up this guy, and he turns out to be a uh, serial killer, and he chases Brooke through the woods to this house where she... Where it turns out that that's a family of serial killers, so it's sort of a uh, going from the frying pan into the fire, and um, the family and the other serial killers sort of battle over who gets to kill Brooke. Now, what was the process like trying to get funding for this film? As this was shot, I believe, 2012? Yeah, around there. Uh, actually, uh, ten years ago, we shot it in 2010. I I finished it. We had it released um, okay. in 2012. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. I only know that because my Facebook memories are showing up now. Ten years ago, we we're like, oh, shot Killing Brook today. Um, so I actually took out a loan to fund this movie. I took out uh, $3,500, which basically went for food and effects. Um, stuff like that. Everyone basically worked for free, which um, I totally appreciate. Um, we could not have made this movie without um, everyone's involvement. You know, it was, we didn't really expect too much from it. Um, we just wanted to see if we could, what we could do. You know, and um, the cast was really great. Um, you know, the the script I think was was pretty good, and everyone just kind of. Did it for experience and uh, credit, and just to, like I said, just to see if we could do it. And uh, you know, the the final product is actually something I'm really proud of. Um, it's my best seller um, at the conventions, and um, it's you know, it's something that I'm, I'm really proud of the most. Since you mentioned you took out a loan for this film, do you recommend that for? Filmmakers trying to get into the business? Only if you have a good way of paying it back. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it took me three years to pay that loan off. Um, and my wife at the time was not too happy that I did that. But I was determined to, to make a movie, you know, any way possible. So bef I think when we made it, I don't think crowdfunding was even around yet. So I don't even think that was really uh, an option. Um, and there's... You know, living in Western Massachusetts, there's not a whole lot for um, investors and stuff. So that was really my only option was to to do the loan. I mean, we could have done some kind of fundraising or whatever, but it just wasn't really in the cards. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it too much. And like I said, unless you've got um, a way of paying it back fairly soon. <laughs> Besides the fundraising pot, what was pre-production like? Um. All right, so we're going back 10 years here with my memory. It was fairly easy, if I can remember. Um, a friend of mine whose house we shot at, uh, we didn't really have to do any set dressing. He was a uh, blacksmith, uh, so he had all these forged tools that he had made, like, hanging on the wall, and he had weird pictures of cats. He was like a, a farmer out in Hatfield, Mass., and uh, it was an old farmhouse, and it was just, like, everything that you see for that set was there. We didn't really do too much additional. But as far as pre-production, you know, um, it was just, I had the script. I think we were only looking for, like, uh, Daggett was the only 
um, role that we needed to cast that I hadn't written for somebody. Everyone else was written with somebody in mind. And um, so we, we had, uh, you know, some casting sessions and we found Ray Herb pretty quickly. Um, he came into uh, the casting session, pretty much scared us all. <laughs> he was like, I'm dang it. Um, he came in in character and just uh, pretty much scared us into casting him. But, uh, you know, it, it worked. And um, other than that, I'm trying to think what else we had to do. You know, I, I it was it was a fairly easy process. Um, the whole thing from start to finish, even production, went really smoothly. Um, we were a well-oiled machine. Now, what was casting like in this film? Because that, one of the things that I liked about this film was the acting. Yeah, so like I said, um, the roles of Darla and Rory and Vance were already cast by with uh, KT, Johnny, and Colin. So it was a matter of finding Daggett and then Brooke. Um, and Brooke, I actually, this girl, Alex Vandell, I, would, I had been friends with for a few years. Um, I had mentioned to her that I was working on this. And she was like, oh, can I can I try out? Um, she's like, I'm, pro- I'm probably terrible, but can I just try out? And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. So she came and she was phenomenal. She has a natural talent. She had never been, I don't even think she had been in a school play. Um, but she, she just was really good um and her scream was was amazing we actually i hold auditions at the uh public safety complex in east hampton for people who feel safe because the police are right there but we were in a we were in an office or a, or a meeting room rather and uh, I, I told her to scream and she's like really i'm like yeah go ahead and scream as loud as you can and you know, so she did, and uh, she's like, "Are the cops gonna come in here now?" I'm like, no, they can't even hear you because they're behind plate glass and or not plate glass, but plexiglass, and uh, the, nobody heard anything. So it's like it, it's kind of funny because we could actually, you know, have someone be screaming and and murdered and right on the police station, and they wouldn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a surreal place to hold an audition. <laughs> Well, like I said, I mean, it, I do it because it's uh, easy to get to. Um, it's a public place, so people, you know, who, who don't know me, um, they feel more easy coming someplace like that um, because, you know, the, the police are right there. As opposed to, I, I know people who, who have done auditions like at their home, and that's just, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. That's just, you know, especially this day and age. Um, so a public place like that, I think is better. Um, and I, I think actually Johnny and I cast Dina, um, at the mall. We, we met her at the mall and, uh, and, uh, at, at the food court and, uh, we cast her from there. Another thing that I liked about this film was the house. What was it like shooting in there for some oh of my the God. film's was, most graphic scenes? It was hot. We were we shot um, you know August of 2010. It was so freaking hot. We were sweating. Um, so that everything. So the, the bathroom scene um, actually was not part of that house um, because the bathroom at that house was was way too small to do anything. Um, the bathroom was actually at my mother's house because she had this huge bathroom with, with plenty of room. So we actually ended up shooting it there. I think we we were there for two or three days shooting that uh, torture scene. It, it was uh, quite the uh, experience. Um, you know, Alex, she was a trooper. Um, with what she went through, we we actually waterboarded her at one time, um, which I didn't mean to happen. But we had the the pillowcase on her head, and we turned the water on, and and then somebody was like, you know, this is waterboarding. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit. So, but you know, she she was a trooper. She 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 dealt with everything that we could throw at her. What were some of the challenges that you faced during production? So the, the one thing that comes to mind is one of the last things that we shot was the uh, the bar scene, and Alex was actually unavailable uh, when we shot that. So we had to have a body double stand in for her. If you watch that scene, you'll notice you never see her face. 
Um, it's because we, we didn't have her on set that day and we had to be creative. Um, I had, um, Ray's girlfriend actually, uh, stood in for, for Brooke. She wore the, uh, dress that, that Brooke wore. Luckily she was roughly the same height. Um, I think with heels too. I think she had heels on, <laughs> but, uh, we, you know, we did her hair the same way that, that, that Alex had her hair and she wore the same dress and we just did a lot of creative angles so you couldn't tell that it wasn't her what was the toughest scene to shoot that's a good question it was either it was one of the torture scenes i think it was either the bathroom scene or the one in the shed um i think the bathroom scene was probably tougher i do remember the shot where vance hits darla with the door that took a couple couple takes um kt had a uh like a sponge or something on her head so she wasn't actually taking the the brunt of the door but you know we did a few takes and and just wasn't coming out right and she was starting to get a headache and uh so i said all right one one more one more take and we managed to to get it on that last take but um that was that was kind of hard for her because like i said she was getting a headache um and then just the scene itself i mean the what we were putting on screen you know stripping down of alex and putting her in the bathtub and slicing her up and pouring bleach on her and um so i i think i think that was probably uh mentally the hardest what was your favorite moment on the set of the film i really like the fight in the dining room um we choreographed that really well i think and that whole sequence where vance gets free and rory's crawling across the table and vance throws him on the floor and and darla you know grabs him and rips his neck and that and then they cut off his finger that was that whole sequence was was really fun now let's move on to the screenplay how did you come up with the film's story you know so you know in the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake with Jessica Biel, where she goes to that trailer and there's the big fat woman. Um, there's the two women there. Um, I kind of got it from there. I guess they weren't involved with Leatherface, but um, that's where I kind of got the idea was where, what if this person was running from this killer and takes shelter in this place that she thinks is safe, but it's really not. It's actually worse than what she was dealing with before. So that's where I kind of came up with the idea. One of the things that I noticed in the screenplay was the main couple in the film are a married LGBTQ couple. What made you want to add that element to the film's story? Um, you know, I just wanted to do something um, different as opposed to the uh, typical girl and guy romance. And... I needed a way to bring Vance into the story, and I just felt um, that it would work better with him seducing two girls as opposed to him trying to get into, like, a, a regular married couple. I, I think Vance would feel um, – he would he would shy away from that. But this, this way he saw two, quote-unquote, victims, easy targets, basically. Um, so it was just a matter of just – doing something different, and then just uh, what worked for the story. What was the screenwriting process like? I had a blast writing it. You know, the, I, I love writing um, sometimes. Sometimes I hate it. But uh, it, it was fun. You know, it was uh, just trying to picture the scenes in my head um, as I'm writing. And uh, it, it, it it's fun, you know, that's kind of the gist of it is it's just it was fun now the first time i heard about this film was at your booth over at the first terracon i believe if memory serves me correct okay uh what made you want to go through the self-distribution route first before finding distribution um wanted to see what we could do um if we could make a name for ourselves um you know, on our own. We, um, Johnny and I had been to, um, Rock and Shock and a couple other conventions and, and saw independent film guys, film people, you know, distributing their own stuff. Um, so we thought we'd, we'd give it a try and, uh, start there. And the thing with Wild Eyes, it sort of fell, 
fell into me. One of the people that did a review contacted me and was like, you know, I know this guy at Wild Eye. I can I can hook you up with them if you'd like. And I'm like, sure. You know, we had, we had done a few cons at that point, and you know, we had moved some product, but I felt like distribution uh, through Wild Eye w- would be beneficial to get it out there. Uh, more than I could, and you know, it, it certainly is. I, I couldn't do it, get it on BestBuy.com and Walmart.com and Amazon on my own. So it, it definitely worked out, and and they gave me the right to still sell at the conventions. That was one of the things that I negotiated for was to be able to keep selling at the convention because it is my my best seller, and I didn't want to lose that revenue even with online distribution now if there's one thing that you wish you could change with either your direction or screenwriting of the film what would it be there's some bits of dialogue that i kind of cringe upon now um you know the the revelation that they're the spades are inbred sort of i i wish i could change that now um other than that um you know just minor maybe minor camera angles or whatnot but considering the budget that we did on $3,500 I I think it it came out really good but like I said yeah I I think I would mostly change some of the dialogue besides the re-release of Killing Brook you recently released a new short about a couple months ago on your Mad Sea Productions YouTube page called Killer Sponge how did you come up with the idea for the short (laughs) Um, I was doing dishes one time and I had uh, this dried up sponge, you know, and, and I got it wet and it grows. And I was like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if the sponge got a taste of blood? And it, it was just kind of stupid how, how it came about. Um, it was just a stupid idea that I kind of ran with, which is what I usually do. <laughs> What made you want to star in the short besides writing, directing, and <laughs> producing? Uh, one word, quarantine. You know, it was during the quarantine for COVID, and uh, I was sitting around, I was bored out of my mind, and I'm like, oh, I could do Killer Sponge. And I, there's not even a script for it. There's literally, I have a little notebook that I just wrote the ideas down for. And at first I was going to have my roommate star in it, but then I'm like, you know what, there's there's some physical aspects um, that I, I, I don't want him doing. I'd rather hurt myself than, you know, him get hurt. So, so yeah, it, it just sort of became me based on, you know, being in quarantine and having no other, not, no other options, really. How long did it take to shoot the short film? A couple days. Um, I think I did it in, like, three days there are two versions of the film on your youtube page one in color and the other in black and white what made you decide to produce two versions of the film Uh, i did the first in color and then i had a couple people suggest that i do it in black and white that it would play better in black and white so i went through and turned it all black and white and i actually have to admit that i do prefer that version better Another thing that I liked about it was the movement of the killer sponge as it felt like it had an old school effect feel to it. How were you able to achieve that effect? Fishing wire. <laughs> um, basically, I had four different sponges that I used for different stages. The shot of the sponge rolling across the floor toward the dog. Um, I actually hollowed out a sponge and had a little race car underneath, and I just kind of pushed it toward the dog. So that's that was that. Uh, but mostly it was fishing wire. I put a paper clip into the sponge and tied fishing wire to that and, and moved it around. Now, how can er- everyone watch a short? Uh, just go to the, it's on the YouTube page, um, or on my Facebook page, uh, Mad Z Productions, um, YouTube or Mad Z Productions on, on Facebook. Do you have any upcoming projects in the works? Uh, I've got a couple ideas, um, that I'm working on. Um, I don't know what I'm going to settle on 
first, but I'm leaning toward Boris the Spider, which I won't get into too much. Uh, the other one that I'm writing is uh, Satan Stole My Dog, but that's one that I probably won't be able to do because it's going to be kind of effects heavy. And that's what I've got going on so far. How can they find you and Mad C Productions on social media? Uh, just look us up, Mad Z Productions, um, in the search bar on, uh, Facebook. We are on Facebook, we've got, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you, Dave, for coming on to my podcast. Hey, I got a little bit of trivia for you on Killer Sponge. Okay. Uh, so the scene, the part where I'm slice my finger i actually sliced my finger um so that is a real take um i was trying to pretend to slice my finger and actually slice my my thumb so the scream that you hear is real (laughs) the shot is real (laughs) so um yeah it was i actually have a scar from that my my thumb is uh has a scar so i ended up in the emergency room but you know you, you uh Sometimes you you blood, sweat, and tears for your projects. Yep, so. most definitely. <laughs> well, thank you, Dave, for coming on to my podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Anthony. Have a good day and stay safe. You too, buddy. I miss you. Same here. See you later. Hey, guys, this is Stephen Christina. I'm the founder, owner, creator, and host of Super Retro Throwback Reviews. Are you looking for the best movie reviews, music reviews, video game reviews, and Comic-Con coverage all around? Well, then look no further. Definitely check out Super Retro Throwback Reviews on YouTube and our new audio podcast, the new and improved Super Retro Throwback Reviews Audio Files version 2.0 on the following media distributors. Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. Class is over, John. Time for something new and improved. Welcome back to Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm here with writer, director, editor, novelist, and actress Loren Malloy to talk about her new film, Yield. How are you doing today? Doing real good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for having me on the show, by the way. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for coming on. Now, before we start talking about the film Yield, I noticed that you are also a writer. Yes, I am. So I'll start with a couple questions about your writing and everything. Wonderful. Before getting into the film business, I've seen you at Con selling your books. What made you want to get into the world of writing novels? Um... Quite honestly, I was a small child already envisioning different worlds of horror in everyday situations to the point that people were concerned. And it really was just an overactive imagination that I just kept pouring onto paper. So from a very, very young age, I knew at some point in life I was going to be writing books and making movies. I had always planned on writing three books, then making my movie yield as well as continue writing books. Now I have seven books, writing my eighth, and I already have two other films in pre-production. So I've kind of always had this mindset and path, as long as, as well as other stuff, because, you know, we always venture off and want to do fun other things, and the universe goes, no, 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 you know, this is the path you got to be on. But I was like first grade reading Edgar Allan Poe going, you know, I need to create my own worlds of horror to shock and terrify people and distract their minds from the real world horror. Who were some of the authors that you inspired you to write these novels? Oh, let's see. There's so many. I When I was in elementary school, I read a lot of the classics. I read Bram Stoker's Dracula, Edgar Allan Poe, um, the, the Haunting of Hill House, so for me, Edgar Allan Poe was a very big influence for me. So it was Grimm's fairy tales. I read those in elementary school as well. These are very twisted, demented stories. And my mind lit up like, you know, a Bunsen burner. It was like, yes, you know. Um, and I think that's why I always have some hidden clues and little things that if you're not paying attention in either the books or the movies in the same kind of way that, you know, Edgar Allan Poe will twist and and weave a tale that you're you're captivated and realizing he's already giving you hints if you're paying attention. So I think him and Richard Matheson are definitely two of the big ones, plus Clive Barker. Um, Cabal, as well as, um, you know, the the hell priest, the hellbound heart, 
those books really did inspire my mind about other worlds of horror that we don't even think about. And that really did kind of interweave everything that I love about horror is those grouping of authors that help inspire my mind to want to create more worlds of horror. How many books have you released to date? And what are some of the titles that you've released? Oh, let's see. I have seven books out so far, working on my eighth. Um, the very first book I wrote was The Very Devil Herself. That's about a mortal cannibal who works for the King of England from the 16th through 19th century, hunting down historical serial killers. So I went through history, found actual serial killers from history, and everything is historically accurate except the immortal cannibal herself, because otherwise history would be totally epic. The other two massive novels that I, you know, always promote is The Storyteller of Pain, which is about a psychiatrist trapped within a lunatic asylum with 13 different types of demons and a deadly surgeon all trying to get her at once. She has to figure out how to survive all of it without the help of a priest because I figure the exorcist been there, done that, got the t-shirt. How would you do it if you didn't have a priest around you? So that's how that book happens. And The Bedtime Killer is about a peeping Tom turned lust killer. So a bit like Richard Ramirez with a bit of a nod to high tension with a lot of gruesome fun that people love to say he Horace is just a really dirty bastard. So, um, and there's always a fun twist in every one of my books because all the reviewers have said they never were able to guess the ending. So that's nice. I also have, um, a children's picture book because I have so many kids in my life and I want to have something they can read as well as a poetry book. And my upcoming book, is the queen of hearts and you have to decide is she a serial killer or a vigilante so that's a big grouping of the books that i've written and are writing so far what made you want to step out of the literary field and go into the world of filmmaking i was fascinated by movie magic when i was a real small child i you know turned on a tv when i shouldn't have and the scene in Beetlejuice where they're ripping their faces off trying to get attention was the first moment I saw. And not only did that terrify me, but it made me want to create movie magic. And I dreamt all of my life of just standing on some movie set, watching that movie magic being created. And then one day I realized that I don't have to be standing around watching it. I could be creating it and making my own movie magic. And before I even wrote The Very Devil Herself, I already told people I'm going to write three books and then I'm going to make the movie yield. And that's exactly what I did. So that's really how that happened. Speaking of yield... Tell everyone about the film. Yield is an interesting movie because it's actually based and inspired off something that actually happened in, in real life, which I'll get to. But Yield is about a couple who goes hiking in a national forest and discovers a cannibalistic family that lives within it called the Carnago Clan. The Carnago Clan uses the tourists like food. So they think of tourists as long pig and food. So they use the forest as a cat and mouse labyrinth to tenderize and terrify their meat. And then they turn it into things like people pizza and kidney and steak pie and stuff like that. Um, and when Danny and Leo's friends go missing in Solaris National Forest, they decide to go in and save them, not knowing the family that lives within. And it becomes a battle of who will win, who will survive, will anyone. And you'll have to find out by watching the movie. And we also will have Yield 2 and Yield 3 coming out. Uh, Yield 2 is going to be the revenge film, and Yield 3 is going to explain how the family even got the land in the first place. You handle a lot of aspects in the film as you're producing, editing, writing, acting, and directing. What made you want to do all these things, and what was it like trying to balance them? <sighs> um... I guess part of it is a control problem. I've always been a one woman circus, you know. I, I, I know that it seems crazy, but I'm always juggling all the hats by myself. With the books, you know, I did all the editing, I made all the covers, I do all the promotion. Truly everything that I've created so far has all been on my own that I've had to learn. So for me, that was no big step in learning everything I need to do to make a movie. So I've always been editing small little clips and films and things. So I've been doing that already. This was just on a grander scale and I had to learn a little more. Um, so for me, I have no fear with learning something and I'd rather learn it and do it myself than, you know, have it fault to someone else who's not going to do it in the same image, I guess. And that's also 
not that anybody wasn't capable of it, but it's because it was my first film, it was almost a need to do it myself. Like the editing, I knew nobody would be able to understand, even if I did every single cell drawn out and the storybook laid out perfectly, you still wouldn't be able to edit it the way my mind had it. Now, is it, you know, Hollywood quality? Maybe not to some people, but it was my first ever. And I did the soundtrack as well. I created all the shirts that all the leads are wearing. Um, I put Easter eggs between my books and uh, upcoming films in there. And with the reasoning for all of that was really because I wanted to prove to myself I could and I know I was capable of it. So I did all the studying, learned all the different aspects and know that in every category, I'm only going to grow with talent and creativity as I practice, learn and keep researching. So that's why I kind of had to. One of the things that I noticed in the film is that this film has an old school shot on video feel to it. What were some of the cameras that were used to make this film? I'm so glad you had that feeling because I purposely wanted that so that you get an intense feeling while watching it. Today's movies are usually entirely too crisp, which in my opinion is why we have a lack of like real emotional connection of an understated fear or a palatable, you know, connection to a character when you have more of a, a grittier quality, maybe is the word for it. Um, actually we used three cameras. We used, um, a 4K camera, we used an iPhone, and we used an Android, all the, the latest iPhone, the latest Android, and, you know, high-tech 4K, and intermingled all of it to give you that home movie feel, because in my mind, it is um, from the point of view of the Carnego clan. So when you get to see the Carnego clan a little bit, they're not polished. They're very gritty. So they're going to make gritty videos that they're going to enjoy in a way which was the most difficult and easiest aspect of filmmaking in your opinion oh, um most difficult i think i don't know i you know i don't i don't think of them in that kind of way i, I think of everything as having a roller coaster ride of, of understanding learning and adapting so with directing there were moments where i had to remember Kind of like when I was teaching children, not as a slam to them, but like you have to remember you can't be friends. You have to be like the boss of a situation. And because I had so many people that I knew and cared about, there were moments where I realized I was being more of a friend than the director. And that was a difficult shift where it was like, guys, I got to go back to being boss and professional for a second. We'll go back to, you know, hanging out and being friends later. Hold on, you know, and that was a difficult switch. But the same thing with editing. There were moments where to make sure everything flowed right, you know, and fixed, you know, background sounds and all that stuff. There were moments in that that were difficult. But I think the easiest is always writing the story and creating it. Those first beginning pre-production moments of is that's why I like writing them out myself. You know, this this is what the film's going to be and being able to adapt it to the characters, to the scenes, to the moments, that probably is the easiest where everything else has its moments of difficulty where you really need to experience it and then just conquer through it. I also noticed that almost everything in the film takes place during the daytime. What made you decide to shoot during the day as opposed to night? Well, there is a moment or two where they're having dinner where it's nighttime, and that's why it says, you'll see it'll say, you know, like 15 hours later because, you know, the couple had to get to the next location. So that's constantly throughout the next day. Um, and that's really what it is. Nighttime scenes in a forest are too been done, been there. It does not bring the same aspect. And I'm tired of looking at a completely black screen when it doesn't need to be. So they're not going to really be hunting at night versus day because you don't really need to so that's really why you have one scene where the first couple goes in during the day because that's when people go hiking they wouldn't be there at night so it doesn't make sense and that's you know versus nighttime hunting what was it like casting this film um it was enjoyable quite honestly because the vast amount of talent that applied was awe-inspiring and then to be able to narrow it down by you know everybody had to audition and send in certain lines and video of themselves and that was 
an incredible experience for me because I already see who the character needs to be in my head. And then I got to go, okay, figure out this character versus the boyfriend character and make sure you would even believe that they go together. So to, you know, it was almost like one of those mix and match books as a kid. You had to make sure the right vibes worked with the right vibes and the right personalities and tones and interactions. And to be able to watch all the different videos of these amazing actors and say, okay, these will flow good together. And you go, yeah, I believe them as a couple was really a fun experience. Which was the most difficult role to cast? Hmm. I don't think there was one. Um, I, because of, of just knowing that I, I would, see the person I would know it when I saw it it really wasn't difficult plus as I was creating this story I had people in mind so um I knew what the characters should kind of act like feel like so I honestly think the the most difficult was just making sure that I picked um the right personalities looks and aspects for the character versus I just really like this person and like how they act you also have a role in the film Tell me about your character in the film. Yeah, that was a, a weird, funny moment because I had planned on making Betsy Carnego, who I play, more of like how Stephen King does his cameos. You know, in Rose Red, he just delivers a pizza and asks if the place is haunted. That's how that was supposed to start. And then my fan base, friends and family were like, you need to be in the film as well. It would, you know, we that would just be silly if you weren't. And then that's how Betsy kind of started. It would just became, all right, so she'll be a full character instead of just flipping a switch and clapping and walking away. And it really was because I got asked to play a major character in it. And it was fun because I've acted in a bunch of stuff before. I had done stuff in high school. I've been in small things or background stuff previously because I wanted to see how people worked and handled their films and, you know, learn from that aspect of watching. So to be able to actually play a major character and have fun with knives and blood and gore, that that's my jam. So I was good. I was happy about it. How did you come up with the film's story? That was inspired off something that happened to me when I went visiting in Florida. I Googled places to go hiking. There was a forest. I started, you know, I drove my car in looking for a parking lot. And there was fences and houses in the middle of like nothing and you know there's a man that looked like something out of american gothic a bit and he's wearing blue jean overalls a straw hat holding a pitchfork and my crazy butt always makes eye contact so i wave not thinking about it or where i am or what could it could be because i'm thinking i'm just going hiking I look at the man and I wave trying to show him just being friendly and he screamed and starts, he drops his pitchfork and starts chasing me. I freak out, drive as fast as possible on this little dirt road, realizing it's a dead end and there's just these little houses, white fences. I have to make a U-turn and go flying out of the place. The guy bashes on his fence, screaming and ranting because he couldn't catch me in time. I get out of there and I find out cops don't go in. It's uh, inland, which means it was grandfathered in. The cops aren't allowed in. It's private property. And most people don't make it out alive. And I did. So <laughs> I did the research on it. And it took a lot of effort. But when you get into some of the archives, you see that in a lot of the national forests, they couldn't get certain groups of families out or they lost the battles. So they actually built the national forests around them and then just pretended they didn't exist so they're all over the united states i'm sure they're all over the world but um florida is one of them georgia is another and that's actually how i based and inspired my story off of that my mind got real creative and thought oh wow since nobody has stories about these very rural hillbilly folk you know going into stop and shop in places where are they getting their food it doesn't say anywhere about a large quantity of animals going through there so where they're getting their food from. So uh, <laughs> that was definitely a terrifying experience. I will never just decide to go hiking off someplace on Google again. <laughs> but that's <laughs> that's the true story. And there's actually a picture in the movie and on the Yield Facebook page of a pair of bloody deer legs hanging over a county sign. That's the picture I took as I'm fleeing 
the place in my Nissan Sentra. <laughs> um, and that literally people are like, you didn't see the freaking sign. I'm like, this one? They're like, oh, my freaking God, you got that close? I'm like, no, I went in. They're like, what do you mean you went in? You know, that kind of conversation. Um, so I never go on vacation and then just go randomly places without checking with like local folk. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I would also assume that's what made you want to set your story in the woods as well. Yes, because that's where I was based in the first place was I thought I was going hiking. I go hiking all the time on Long Island. There's, you know, legit places with mapped out paths. Um, so I thought this national forest was going to have, you know, that. And then I don't know if I just made a wrong turn. Yes, I used the movie pun um, or not. But <laughs> these people were not mutants. These were not like creepy looking folk until he's like screaming gibberish and chasing me. This was just like you'd expect it to be some country grandpa about to be like, you want to hear a story? Let me get my corn pot. That, then he just screaming and chasing me. And that's when it changed. It was like, oh, wow. Okay. So that's why Yield 3 is going to be, like, how they got the land. How did you come up with the idea for the Carnego family? Um, Because of that guy and all the houses I saw, there was at least 15 little ranch houses with white fences. I didn't see many other people. That by itself made me a little spooked. If my car is racing, there's music blasting, and this old creepy man is running faster than I could ever run, and there's nobody coming out to look, what the hell? Um, <laughs> but also I love House of a Thousand Corpses and the Firefly family is just probably one of my favorites. So in my way, it's also a nod to them without just redoing that family. It's my take on a mashup of my version of the Rob Zombie family he made and these people I saw. What was the screenwriting process like, considering that you've come from the literary world? It was a pain in the butt at first, <laughs> because, you know, writing novels, you need to describe to people every nuance so it's a movie in their head. This is the opposite. This is the this is the cut, dry, black and white. You know, you're not saying what the fields look like or what the person's feeling. You're going, no, don't stop, you know, that kind of thing. So for me, I had written out entirely too much at first. And a friend of mine read it and he's like, you're, this is a short story, not a script. I'm like, you're right. Darn, darn, darn. So um, that was a bit difficult only because it was the first time. But I likened everything in this first film to like the first time I had to write a book and do all the steps it was okay i'm learning if i could learn that i can learn this i can adapt and then my brain was able to switch over and it's still a bit of a process because it's so structured but um one of the programs i use it helps you where you just you know put the character and it has all the format so it helps you out and once i found that uh through studio binder it made such a huge difference i wasn't worrying about um, am I doing this right? It is quite literally like put the character's name, got it, write what he's saying, got it, write with the scene, you know, that kind of thing versus, oh, I hope I'm doing this correctly in words. So for anybody that's going from literary to writing scripts, Studio Binder is definitely the way to go, in my opinion. Are there any plans to revisit the Carnego clan in literary form? Not at the time. Um, not really at this moment. More another movie where, you know, these people are going to get their butt kicked for eating friends of the people going in. Um, I think it's also because I have other books I'm working on and the very devil herself, Alexandra de Longcry, she needs another novel and those fans are asking for it. So um, maybe at some point I will turn the movies into books because the fan base asks for it. But at this moment, no, <laughs> Besides filmmaking and writing, you also have an online store called Happy Horrors. How did you come up with the name, and what made you also want to branch out into merchandising? Happy Horrors has been my catchphrase and tagline since I first started in the industry. That's what I write in every book. That's how I end every interview, etc., 
Um, so that's what I always say. Happy horrors. Also, my film production company is Happy Horrors Productions. Um, so from the very beginning, I've always had shirts and decals and all sorts of stuff. So having a store online where everything between autographed pictures of me to my books, to DVDs, to shirts, to aprons, to more, because I just love creating. And if there's something that somebody wants with that on there, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> what stuff can people find on that site? Um, you can find some awesome stuff that I've made. I have fa face masks. I have all sorts of pocketbooks. Um, I have my DVD yield you can be able to get as well as all sorts of pictures of me that I'll sign, um, posters, hoodies, tank tops, pants, all sorts of stuff. You'll definitely be able to find anything you like. And if it's not there, fans can hit me up and I will make sure the item they're looking for is in the store. There's even shower curtains. I also noticed that you have a new podcast called Let's Pie with Loren. What made you want to get into the podcasting world? Um, well, it's a live TV show on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and I've been talking about that for probably as long as anything else because it's always been part of the game plan. It's a different kind of game show where people get to have a lot of fun for about an hour. We drink, we smoke, we laugh a lot. We forget about reality for a little bit. We get to be silly, and as well as my guests get to promote what's going on with them. That way, the indie community can still reach out to new fans and new people without really trying to, you know, give themselves some difficulty. I also have some other shows coming out um, through Happy Horrors Productions, and the Let's Party with Loren is a Thursday night game show um, that you can find on Facebook and YouTube every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Tuesday nights, meaning um, every Tuesday night, 8 p.m., I also now have our show, Three Crazy Bitches Talk, and it's um, three ladies, and we're all going to be talking about some crazy topics, which is a lot of fun. And then I have another TV show that's Spooky Bitches, because that's one of my um, titles that my fan base has given me. And we are talking about only paranormal topics, and that will be coming out soon as well. So I, I can't seem to stop making stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Besides the podcast, what are some upcoming projects that you have in the works? Oh, well, I am so excited. I got hired by the Token Dead guys. They have an amazing comic that you can actually see in Yield as an Easter egg. They hired me to turn the Token Dead comic into a feature horror film. So Toby and Duke, um, you can find it on Facebook and Instagram as well as Twitter. Toby and Duke, we're actually looking for sponsors. It's all about zombies and cannabis because I'm pro-cannabis, about healing and all that stuff. So it's another way to get it out there where we get a little humor, we get a lot of fun, and you get to have some zombies too. And these guys, Toby and Duke, wind up smoking this interesting strain that doesn't affect them and they get to be protected versus other zombies. Maybe we'll find out, but um, you can find that on Facebook as well. I also have The Devil's Lettuce, which is another movie. Three guys are wind up smoking a bowl, breaking it in a cemetery. They decide to smoke out of a human skull. They get possessed and start killing people. So those are the two that we have in the works right now, as well as my uh, paranormal show, Spooky Bitches, which you'll see through the uh, Happy Horror Store. There are notebooks and T-shirts of that as well. Um, so that's what's going on right now. Where can we find you on the web and social media? You probably can find me on every form of social media if you look up my name, L-O-R-E-N-M-O-L-L-O-Y. But you can find me on Facebook. Uh, Loren Malloy FB. So if you put that, that after Facebook.com, you'll find me. Uh, Instagram is Loren underscore Malloy. Twitter is Loren Malloy. And you can find me on YouTube. Please look me up on YouTube and subscribe because when I hit 1,000 viewers and subscribers, I will be uploading the movie Yield for people to be able to rent and stream. So once I hit 1,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, People will be able to stream the movie and not just get the DVD version. So make sure you look up my name, L-O-R-E-N-M-O-L-L-O-Y. Loren Malloy. <laughs> well, thank you, Loren, for coming on to my podcast. 
Have a good day and, and stay safe. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful time. I appreciate it. And happy horrors. Same here. They're coming to get you, Barbara. This is Carrie. This is Billy. This is Mr. Bo. And we are from a podcast from Beneath. You can catch us every Wednesday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. For the latest news and information on Anthony G's Horror Show, you can check out Anthony G's Horror Show on his social media platforms at Anthony G's Horror Show on Facebook, Instagram, and Slasher app at Anthony G's Horror on Twitter. Anthony G's Horror Show can be found on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash Anthony Thurber. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com and you can find Anthony Keys Horror Show on the web at anthonykeyshorrorshow.blogspot.com What's Anthony T watching this time? I'm watching another film that was shot during quarantine. You may know earlier in the program I talked to David Zagowski about his short film on YouTube, Killer Sponge, which was shot in quarantine. Well, there's a film recently released on Shudder that was also shot in quarantine and shot on a Zoom call. That's right. You can make movies on a Zoom call. And that's the case with this film that I'm going to talk about. The film is Host. It recently premiered on Shudder. And let me tell you, this is one of the best films I've seen all year. This is a film that you don't expect much from, considering that the whole film is pretty much shot on Zoom. So you're literally not expecting expecting much but host really is a very good film i have to say it's definitely again one of the best films of 2020 so far that i've seen and one of the main reasons why this film succeeds very well it's the direction from rob savage he does a very good job in really keeping my interest in this film throughout as this is a film where it's very hard to keep one's interest in in the film story considering that the film is being shot through a zoom call that itself makes a film complicated but the real credit to why this film is so good is the way that director rob savage approached this film he really does a good job in the way that he directs his cast as i thought his cast really took the material seriously and really had fun with it as this is a cast that really had to work outside the box considering that the limitations they had to deal with in regards to how this film was filmed as let's face it it's probably 10 times harder to act in a film that is being shot via a zoom call and the actresses in this film do a great job here as they really keep their characters interesting and you actually care about the characters that they play. Most of that also has to do with the direction from Rob Savage as I really think he did a great job directing them as this is a very hard film to make frankly because you're literally shooting this film on a zoom call which presents problems within itself and to really make a film that has interesting characters, has very good performances, and has action that really makes you jump out of your seat. It is definitely a film that you should definitely be checking out on Shutter, as this is a very good film. And the last 20 minutes of this film, I think are some of the best 20 minutes I've seen this year in a horror film, as that's when this film really goes to another level as that's when the action really kicks up to 10 and to have a film shot on a zoom call and have great action it's very rare you do not see this in this type of filmmaking usually there's something that goes wrong 
or there's something that yeah, it's okay, but really doesn't generate any sense of emotion. That last 20 minutes was horrifying. And it, I would have to say it's probably the best 20 minutes you will see this year if you're a horror fan. Because Rob Savage does a great job in making sure that this film is terrifying. And to do it in quarantine is just simply an amazing piece of work. I like it when directors think outside the box. R Director Rob Savage does that. He does that very well. And Host is a great film that is easily in my top five films of 2020. I really highly recommend if you're a fan of horror, you check out Host on Shudder as Rob Savage's direction is excellent and the film's cast also is very good i would even put this above unfriended as best internet horror if we're gonna call it this type of subgenre mind as well call it internet horror because the film was shot over the internet so definitely check out host on shutter it's definitely one of the best films i've seen all year and quite frankly, this film will probably be in my top 10. It's just that great. It's just that inventive. And it's just that outside the box thinking that I like from directors who take a chance and they succeed. And Rob Savage succeeds in creating a great little horror film with Host. You can check that film out on Shudder. If you check out Anthony T's Horror Show on YouTube, I recently did another rant between episodes since I didn't know when I would have a chance to rant about something. Plus, it was a topic that I did not want to put on the podcast because, quite frankly, I was angry. Not like in the beginning angry, really angry at what was going on at the recent Days of the Dead show. I'm not talking about the controversy because, quite frankly, it is disgusting. Just watch the YouTube video. You'll see what I'm talking about. Because I don't want to talk about this anymore because I found it very disgusting with what happened at the Days of the Dead recently. So, check out Anthony T's Horror Show YouTube page. Just type in Anthony T's Horror Show in the search bar on YouTube. With that, I want to thank you for listening to this episode. Have a good day, stay safe, and support indie horror.